Again, we're here today at the Hunter Byrne Memorial Lorcana Championship. We want to thank the Hunter Byrne Memorial Foundation for hosting this tournament. This is their 10th anniversary for the tournament. They always raise awareness for suicidal ideation within the gaming community and have a local outreach community program to try to raise awareness of mental health. If you would like to donate, this year's charity is 988. It's a suicide and crisis lifeline. 988 is a U.S. national number that you can dial anytime you or a loved one are facing suicidal ideations or a mental health crisis. Hello and welcome to the Hunter Burton Memorial Lorcana Championship. I'm your announcer, Sir Ashtown. Joined with me is the Illumiteers and Liam here alongside me. Hey, Liam. Hey, Wesley. How's it going? Good. Well, we are looking here at round three of six, Steven versus Lorcana Bro. There are a couple of Lorcana Bros. I'm guessing this is Aaron, who has played in, many of you may have seen him at PPG Houston, I believe he got second place. A uh, really competitive player, and so great to see this matchup between the two. He did. He took second place, only losing to Bobby Brake, a former Kaijudo world champion. Um, Aaron Rubin, an excellent player, um, and uh, a former Magic professional player as well, played on the Pro Tour for, for a few years, so um, high caliber Lorcana player. That's amazing. It's great to see these competitive players come out here today to play at the Hunter Burton, Moore, Hunter Burton Memorial's first Lorcana Championship. And to see Aaron come and just uh, really play th at this level of competitive Lorcana, excited to see these two Ruby Amethyst players play against one another. Well, here's Steven starting us off with a turn one Chernabog's followers. There's the turn one Minnie Mouse. Uh, Minnie Mouse is a great turn one play for this deck. I mean, I, I know a lot of us are familiar with this build, but uh, Minnie Mouse serves two purposes. You know, one, early board presence and can challenge early, but also serves as a teeth and ambitions target uh, with her three willpower, allowing her to stand up uh, after being hit with that. So um, allows Aaron some options on turn two for removal. Well, we see that Chernabog's followers questing. Opting not to banish it to draw a card. Lorcana Bros. Uh, Aaron taking advantage of that with uh, taking it out with a mini.
turn to Kuzco. Um, Aaron uh, plays oftentimes with all foil decks, um, so oh. you'll notice the cards look a little more shadowy than usual. But because they're they're mostly foil uh, in this in this deck list. I can remember going to my first PPG Houston tournament. Lots of players there, and a player had a full enchanted ruby amethyst deck, and it was incredibly impressive to see. I, uh, you may see one or two of those uh, enchanted cards in Aaron's deck as well. Well, Aaron at three uh, ink, able to play a Madame and Fox, bouncing back that injured mini. Something that Madame and Fox is always great at is resetting any of your characters that may have damage on them. Just able to reset them, that way you can either ink them later on or replay them. That's a great point, Wesley. I think not a lot of people appreciate that about what Fox can do, or, or some do, but some people don't realize. Um, you know, for those early game cards that are great on turn one or two or three, like the Minnie Mouse on turn one, um, its best use later game is for ink. So Madam M allowing you to return that, and you can ink that card instead of something else that you may want better. That can be just such a really high skill level play, remembering that you can always use that car that you've bounced now with the Madame Mim to ink it. And we may see that from Lorcana Bros as Madame Mim, as uh, the Minnie Mouse doesn't see as much use now that the turns have gotten this late into the game. I see Steven playing that new Rafiki he has been seeing a lot of play lately, just an early card that also has Challenger. Pinocchio, fun, fun little utility card there, exerting a character when he comes into play, uh, making a previously ready character exerted so you can you can challenge or remove it as uh, Steven did with the goat there. Yeah, these, this this Ruby Amethyst matchup became a lot more interesting with Into the Inklands. Um, you know, one of the things that um, that Inklands did is provide another uh, finisher for this Ruby Amethyst list in locations. Um, some decks run a lot of them, some run fewer. Uh, I'd venture to guess that we see, uh, and we will see Queen's Castle in both of these lists, uh, one more than others. And so um, one of the ways that you can try to finish this game out is yeah, a little bit of board control, try to keep some high strength characters off your opponent's board, play a Queen's Castle uh, before uh, opening up, before Be Prepared becomes available on turn seven. Uh, those locations, of course, sticking around with the be prepared. So um, it becomes very difficult after you're able to, to after be prepared and some of your removal options are available for your opponent to get enough strength to stick on the board to get rid of that seven willpower location. Um, so I think that's probably something in both these players' heads. You know, try to try to keep control of the board until I can play my queen's castle and then use my removal to prevent my opponent from from removing it. Like you were saying, just the Queen's Castle at 7 toughness and just gaining you 2 lore every turn, that it really starts to add up and it can really sneak in there early on. We see Steven here playing a Spellbook, another card that can sneak in some extra ink, I mean lore. That way, if, you're not, uh, have a, if you don't have a board state due to a Be Prepared from your opponent, you can always use this Spellbook to gain lore each turn. A spellbook, spellbook, a really fun card. It actually, I think, last uh, last season, we'll call it, uh, with with um, Rise of the Floodborne, it kind of fell out of favor a little bit. Um, it's uninkable, um, and the control decks really looked for other ways to close games out. But you started to see it come back into the meta, oftentimes for the mirror match against other Ruby Amethyst control decks. Uh, you mentioned PPG Houston. Um, one of the things that set apart Aaron's deck from Bobby Breaks in the final, it was a Ruby Amethyst mirror match, was Bobby ran spellbooks for the mirror and Aaron didn't. And that's one of the things that I think allowed Bobby to close out and win the finals against uh, Aaron's uh, Ruby Amethyst deck. And so uh, we've seen spellbooks now uh, become more prominent in the meta after that. 
Um, and so it's interesting to see uh, Aaron adopt this spell book um, after, after it made an impression on him, let's say, in the Houston finals. And we see here that Aaron, as you're saying, Liam, it did make an impression because he is running one spell book in his deck list. Steven here on the board, having played a Pinocchio to tap down Aaron's Merlin Rabbit, finishing it off with that uh, Madame M Snake, now uses the Queen's Castle, as Liam was discussing earlier, placing Pinocchio on that location, allowing him to be able to draw a card, an additional card, on his upkeep. Yeah, that's a great point. And that the one answer, the one big <laughs> answer that Ruby has to the Queen's Castle is Maui. Maui not quite enough on its own, um, but that's really, you know, I, I'd venture to guess that both of these players are going to be looking to those Mauis as the Queen's Cancel, uh, Queen's Cancel, Queen's Castle answer <laughs> this game. Maui, of course, being a, one of the favorite cards from set one, first chapter, really strong with this 6-5 rush, really can come in there and take out those locations that you think are going to stick around for a little bit with just the extra help like you were saying. We'll see if those Pinocchios from both of these players are able to tap down and be used for a Maui cleanup afterwards. As, as mentioned before, uh, Aaron likes to play the, play the bling. As, as Tamato would say, this Maui is shiny. I've been talking with people about what cards or what person I'd love to have sign one of these Lorcana cards. And of course the artist is a go-to, but to someday maybe have Dwayne The Rock Johnson sign a Maui. <laughs> oh, you're right. What a great idea. <laughs> that would be uh, an amazing accomplishment. <sighs> Adding that to my Lorcana bucket list. Well, here's Lorcana Bros. Uh, Aaron having a, quite a board stay here with these Cusco's able to draw if they are banished and having that Maui as kind of the enforcer to clean up some of the extra cards on Steven's side. Doesn't really fear a be prepared uh, knowing that these Cusco's will be able to draw him a card. And plenty cards in hand here, um, you know, leveraging rabbits and, and other cards to keep a, a healthy hand size. You know, once you get to turn seven against any Ruby deck, you're worried about that be prepared and you're trying not to overextend yourself. Um, so having a having a full grip, as they say, um, it, makes you, it makes you feel a lot more comfortable, um, you know, after turn seven. And there's Aaron, AKA Lorcana Bros, really making quick work of his turn, having his game strategy just in mind, playing very quickly. Yeah, Steven, I, I think, would love a be prepared at this point, allowing the spell books to stick around, you know, clearing the board. I think Lorcana Bro would, would be able to build up, you know, again, pretty quickly. But um, but that be prepared, uh, clearly something Steven's, Steven's hoping for. Another interesting conclusion that we have, or inclusion that we haven't seen uh, played yet, but are in both of these players' lists, is the Maui's Fishhook. This card giving your Maui characters or other characters evasive and then giving them a bump to be able to get rid of a location on their own. That's a fantastic point. This is a card that I think is getting more and more popular. Um, I saw a tournament report recently and, and you know, the, the winning player tweeted, um, my first thought after playing uh, in this tournament is, do not ink Maui's Fisher because you can avoid it because it's a great, great utility card uh, late in the game. Um, so I think this it's a great observation. I think this is a card we'll continue to see um, in deck lists moving forward. We'll see if it makes a play. Both of them are playing too. We'll see if maybe Maui can make an appearance with the fish hook. If not, uh, it's still able to be played and utilized for other characters. But Lorcana Bros here having so many characters, a lot of lore to be able to be gained. And here's Steven with his Merlin Goat. That's something about uh, the Pinocchio, the talkative puppet. He's able to come into play and tap down a troublesome character on your opponent's board, allowing that Maui that's over there in the corner to clean up that uh, goat.
Yeah, tough, tough position to be in here again. Be prepared would be a would be a nice play for Steven if, if he can draw into it. Probably the the only answer at this point. Um, keeping Lacanabra from closing out the game. Of course, anytime you're playing against Amethyst and you're at 17, 18 lore, the goat just becomes so uh, so scary. Um, but with that being said, uh, you know Steven clearly not without to be prepared doesn't have an answer, and um, that's game one. Well, what? Great gameplay from both Lorcana Bros, Aaron, and Steven playing the Ruby Amethyst Mirror Match. We want to thank them so much for being willing to be here on our feature match. And for you, the viewers at home, for watching on Twitch. If you miss any of the tournament rounds, you can head on over to 20lore.pro slash YouTube and watch the previous rounds from today's tournament. But thank you all so much for joining us here today and for the Illumiteers for co-casting with us. Great to have you all. Oh, thanks for having us. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure. Well, as we're going into game two of round three, just want to give a quick word from our sponsors. We want to thank the Hunter Burton Memorial Foundation for allowing us to be here today and sponsoring this event. The Hunter Burton Memorial is an event that's done yearly. This is their 10th anniversary that raises awareness of suicidal ideations within the gaming community. All of your charitable donations goes towards 988, which is a suicide and crisis lifeline for those who are struggling with any mental crisis or through deep depression. If you or a loved one is facing any of those challenges, reach out to 988, where it is a US national number that can help find you the resources uh, for whatever you may be facing. We want to thank Luis, the Lorcana artist of Mufasa. He donated his signature onto the cards. That way we can raffle them off to our players here today and be given out as prizes to the top eight. Thank you so much, Luis, for what you do for the Lorcana community and for donating here today for the Hunter Burden Memorial Lorcana Championship. We want to give another big shout out to GFQ Underground for printing those playmats that y'all are seeing on the playmats right in front of you on the feature match. They did a great job of printing those playmats and working alongside Diamond Ink Apparel, who we saw in an interview earlier today. Diamond Ink Apparel does custom artwork for playmats, t-shirts, or anything that you may need artwork for, and they were able to do that artwork that you see below on the playmats. We want to give a huge shout out to the Pixelborn Patreon community who donated over $2,000 to the Hunter Burton Memorial Foundation and to 988. If you're part of the Pixelborn Patreon community, we want to thank you so much for donating to today's event. We want to give a shout out to the Card Haven in Louisville, Texas. The Card Haven helps provide prize support by Lorcana Packs for all of our top contenders. And we want to thank the Card Haven in Louisville, Texas for allowing us to have the prize support to be able to host this tournament. And lastly, we want to give a huge shout out to Evolutions Trading in Colleen, Texas, who provided the Dex Box and Sleeves along with the Lorcana prize support to be given out to our top contenders. Thank you so much for your support, Evolutions Trading. We appreciate you and your contribution to raising awareness to suicidal ideation within the gaming community. So Wesley, I have, I have a question. Let's, let's say you're watching this stream and we just heard you go through that list of sponsors and we heard about this cause and, it, and it's something that inspires you. Um, and maybe you want to donate a little bit of money to the Hunter Burton Foundation or 988. Is there a way that people can do that? Yeah, if you head on over to the Hunter Burton Memorial Open.com, on the side panel, they have a charitable donation link via PayPal you can select the amount that you would like to donate to the foundation. Or you can also donate here on Twitch. If you donate to Twitch or give anything to our Twitch channel today, it'll all be given over to 988 and to the Hunter Burden Memorial Foundation. That's very cool. Thank you so much, Liam, for asking that, for bringing that up. If you afterwards are watching this on YouTube and you still want to donate, we'll have links in the description where you can go directly to Hunter Burden Memorial's website and donate to the Hunter Burton Memorial Foundation. Well, here we go into game two of round three. Aaron leading us off here with a Cusco. 
we saw that he had these Cusco's uh, last game, two of them, and he certainly does like to use Cusco, that little llama. It wouldn't be a mirror match if both the players didn't play the same turn three, would it? <laughs> it would not. Um, <laughs> Maleficent and her friends over there on Steven's side. You know, gosh, it, again, it's one of those things that makes Amethyst just so so frustrating to play against is you know, they, they consistently, we're seeing all the cards here uh, that allow both these players to, to keep their hands full. Um, it, you know, Amethyst has plenty of ways to build up a board state while keeping cards in hand, um, providing them answers, drawing into their answers for late game. Um, we're seeing both players make, make use of that right now. Yeah, just seeing Maleficent seeing friends on the other side, you just know your opponent's getting so many resources. And then next turn playing a rabbit, um, really trying to find the cards that you need to have the right cards when you need them. We're looking at both lists, and one thing that I see quite different from Steven's list compared to Aaron, aka Lorcanabro, is Steven is playing no Maleficent dragons, whereas Aaron is playing two of them. Why do you think the uh, inclusion or lack of that card would be helpful for us, Leon? You know, I don't know. I, well, I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, I also noticed that Aaron's running two dragon fires as well, so targeted removal there um, for Aaron. You know, th so both these players uh, have different kind of end games in mind. Um, Aaron, you know, is building up towards uh, you know some higher end characters, trying to keep control of the board with some Madame Medusas, with um, the targeted dragon fires, with Maleficent, um, and then just try to close out the game in the more traditional way. Um, one of the other differences is Aaron is only running two Queen's Castles as opposed to Steven, who's running four. Um, I think Steven has made the choice to, to take out those Maleficents probably in favor of, and there's all, all sorts of decisions that go into it, but in favor of more Queen's Castles, probably looking towards the Queen's Castles and the spell books as kind of the, the finishers. So there, there are two different end states in mind for this deck. Um, Steven clearing the board with Be Prepared, with you know targeted removal, um, and then trying to get the Queen's Castles to stick and the spell books to stick. Whereas uh, Aaron is running a lot more traditional of the Ruby Amethyst build that we've been, we've been seeing. Um, yes, there's a spell book for the mirror, but more likely he's looking at the Queen's Castle for card draw and then just using kind of the traditional end game that we see from Ruby Amethyst um, with, a, with a hard board control. That makes a lot of sense because another inclusion that Steven has, or I'm sorry, that Aaron Lorcana Bros, the more traditional list that you were saying, he's also running the minis that we saw him play during game one, along with the Teeth and Ambitions. Both of those are cards in which we've seen in set two a lot of Ruby and Amethyst players have in their deck list. But this time, Steven playing Cavalmore kind of into the Inklands list doesn't have those cards. Here's Steven with that spell book in play, trying to gain as much lore as he can along with the new Rafiki. Yeah, it's, it's spell book. Gosh, it's, I could talk about spell book all day in this matchup. It's so fun. Um, one of the, the differences between the, the way these two players are using this card is um, uh, um, spell book started to see, as we talked about, more prominent in the Ruby Amethyst meta um, last season, but really as a, as a finisher. It's like, if nothing else is working and I'm close to closing out the game and my opponent has board control, what can I put on the board in the late game to kind of close it out? Steven is using the spell books. He's running three of them instead of one, and he's using them more in the mid game. So trying to get it to stick, uh, knowing that the opponent is going to be controlling the board a lot, um, trying to get it to stick in the mid game, and then using it to, to tick down towards the end of the game. Um, so kind of two different spell book philosophies, I think, here. Um, and it's interesting to watch them play out. Spellbook just being one of those cards, like you were saying, that if you don't have an answer for items, you are really watching the lore kind of take up. And if you don't have an answer, it can really take away the game sometimes, especially towards the end. We saw on the last turn, Aaron, aka Lorcana Bro, using his Pinocchio to tap down Steven's Merlin Rabbit to banish it. Now we see Steven playing that Madame Medusa. 
great target to removal. We've seen it used a lot against Beast and Robin Hood, champion of Sherwood, due to it being able to take out three or less power characters. Seeing lots of characters move off the board here. Madam Medusa, such a good card. A card that Ruby didn't know it needed, and then it appeared, and Ruby players were like, oh, this is this is great. Um, as you highlighted, so many fantastic characters with three strength, from the Beast to the Robin Hood. Excuse me. Um, so just a fantastic, fantastic addition to this deck list. Well, I remember playing Lady Tremaine, and your opponent would have two characters on board, and you couldn't quite get rid of the troublesome Beast that you wanted to get rid of. And now with this Madame Medusa, you see a lot clearer of a solution for all the Ruby players. Absolutely. Steven playing a Madame M. Fox. Quite a bit of ink on both sides of the board. Steven using that spellbook to gain another lore. Wow, and there comes down that Maui dealing such big damage. Oh, both players seem to have so many cards in their hand right now. These uh, Maleficents and, and Merlin Rabbits really doing a lot of work for both of these players this game. As you say that, here comes a friend from the other side to to charge that hand even more. And it's it's this is a we've moved into a new phase in the game. You know, anytime Ruby players move into turn seven and be prepared as an option, now you have to start taking that into consideration. So both players trying, I think, at this point to to start squeaking out, you know, putting a little bit out, trying not to overextend themselves, get one or two lore each turn, control the board. But it's all about it's all about a very measured progression uh, at this point. Um, I'd venture to guess both players probably with the card draw have a be prepared in hand, so they're both sitting there, you know, thinking about when they wanna when they wanna play that. That's such a great way of putting it. A measured aggression, really trying to figure out what you need to put out when to take care of the things on the board, as well as extend yourself that way you can gain enough lore to continue to try to win the match. Absolutely. There's another line here that I that I, I want to point out. That it, and you asked about Maleficence earlier, and and talking about the differences between these two decks. There's a line that Aaron has available, which which Stephen does not, and that is um, playing a Maleficent, you know, on turn nine, remove a target, and then that gives him the ability to sing, be prepared, um, and with the amount of cards in hand, uh, sing, be prepared, and then you know Aaron can can start to refill the board before Stephen, giving him a little bit more. Um, of an advantage. Um, that option not available for for Steven. And so Steven's thinking about that. If a Maleficent gets played, um, how do I you know, have answers for it so I can remove it before it has the chance to sing a Be Prepared um, and then allow Aaron to, to put those first few characters on, on board. Wow, two Queen's Castles from Steven. That seemed like a buildup from all those cards that he'd been drawing. Now Steven being in a place where if we see the Be Prepared, like you were saying, Liam, that he wants it. It is welcome. No, that's that's exactly right. Be Prepared is, is the best possible thing um, this turn. Now, Aaron, of course, with, with answers here, uh, there's, a, there's a fish hook out there, which can, can give a little extra... Um, extra strength and the Madame Medusa has you know some, some strength as well to deal with uh, at least one of these but um, but to your point I, I think this is kind of an indication that Steven's like all right maybe it's time now to to clear the board try to control it um, let my Queen's Castle stick around after a board wipe and uh, and do some work well there's another Maleficent singing friends on the other side who would have thought those two Disney characters, uh, the song and the character, would uh, go together so well, but they certainly do. Indeed. Goodness, two Queen's Castles, that's four lore a turn without you having to do a whole lot. 
we'll see if Aaron, aka Lorcano Bros, figures out a way to deal with one or two of them. Steven, during his last turn, moving that Maui over to the, one of the Queen's Castles, allowing him to be able to draw an extra card if it sticks around. One of the reasons Fish Hook's so good. Uh, there's <laughs> that Challenger 3 on Madame Medusa, total of 7, allowing to remove that one, that one Queen's Castle. So this, this really is the, a, a very good setup here for, um, for a Be Prepared. Um, one note on the, on the fish hook, again, one of the things that, that makes it so good here, that challenger ability, um, you know, we mentioned uh, Maui is probably one of the best answers to a location. Um, and so uh, coupled with the fish hook would allow a, a one shot removal of the Queen's Castle. And there's the be prepared, um, wow. as we suspected uh, was yeah. coming. <laughs> that, fush, that fish hook just being such a uh, kind of at first glance an underwhelming card but really paying off a whole lot especially sticking around here with uh be prepared having been played now it stays and you can really use it to clean up the next queen's castle that steven has on board let's see if we see the the maui fishhook combo here Oh, we do not. It is a crab. Oh, well, using that crab on the Madame Mim Fox with its ability when it leaves to give Madame Mim Fox the challenger enough on its own to get rid of the Queen's Castle. That's exactly enough, in fact. That was seven altogether. Such a good combo. Wow. Or yeah. Bro playing his own the Queen's Castle, moving that Madame Mim Fox over to help draw him some cards. It's tough to know, like you were saying, Liam, when to aggressively push your cards out. And it seemed like Steven went to go put the setup for him to be able to survive and be prepared afterwards. Meanwhile, Aaron, aka Lorcana Bros, was able to just hold off until he saw Steven make the play and then just dump everything out. Yeah, I know exactly. It, against these control decks, um, sorry, the delay, I was, I was thinking through uh, what's in these players' heads. Um, it, T to your point, yeah, it's, it's tough to know when exactly, because these decks are building up, they're waiting for their moment, they're, you're building, you're getting the tools in your hand, you're kind of waiting for that, that time where you're like, okay, this is it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. Um, and it's so tough to know when. On the one hand, you know, um, you don't want your opponent to, you don't want to go too early, but you also don't want your opponent to draw into those answers. Um, you know, in this scenario, uh, Lorcana Bro, you know, Aaron, you know, probably wanted the Maui there to couple with the fish hook, but um, didn't have it. But not having that was able to use the goat fox effectively as well. So if he didn't have that, perhaps Steven, you know, allows that Queen's Castle to stick around another turn or two, um, is in a bit, or, a bit of a better spot. But um, yeah, it's, it is fun watching these two, you know, this, this match here because both these players are so good and they're just, they're just, you know, one or two answers a turn kind of, you know, creeping up on the lore count and it's just such a measured, such a measured game. Yeah, a lot of ebb and flow back and forth. And when it goes to this level of Lorcana, it really takes a lot of skill to make the right move at the right time. And, and we're seeing that happen here on, on the board. Yeah, the, other, the other thing to point out, um, I know uh, both player, you know, we all think about 20 lore is the, is the victory condition, and that's what we're that's what we're pushing for is 20 lore. When you're running a deck with uh, with spellbooks or against a deck with spellbooks with goats and with bounces um, available, like Madame Mim, um, 16 and 17 lore becomes this critical point. Um, 
If you ever watched like Bobby Brake pilot these decks, um, and he, he loves Ruby Amethyst, he's playing a lot, Bobby Brake being a former Kaijuta world champion, um, he always sets up these turns where he can get three, four, five lore in a single turn. He's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting. Um, and as soon as he gets, you know, to like 15 or 16 lore, he'll end the game right there. And, um, and so when you're playing against these decks and you're watching the lore counts tick higher, don't think about 20 lore as being the win condition. Think about 16 or 17 lore being the win condition because these decks are able to close out very fast from that point forward. You're right, Liam. I've seen that so many times with these Ruby Amethyst players, but just using the back, uh, the bounce package that these Amethyst players have really makes all the cards, which seemingly by themselves are good, even better as you're able to bounce them or use them to help get the extra inkling that you need out of them to get the game. Lorcana Bro, having 17 lore on the board, really has a huge board stay here. We'll see if Steven can't find something to help clear up some of this. Well, even 17 lore, but with the spellbook and with the goat showing 19 lore. Um... Really, really a challenging situation. We, we see Steven with the be prepared, but even then, um, wiping the board uh, leaves Lacrona Bro at, at 18 with a spellbook. It's 19, wow. and now um, you know one turn to, to try to figure out a way to. I don't know. Remove the spellbook. I don't know. I don't know that that's available. Yeah. I think you called it exactly right, Liam. That Lacrona Bro had seen himself at 16 and kind of had the rest already on board presented with the goat and the spell book and there's the fist bump from Aaron aka Lorcana bros ah it's such a good deck you know Wesley sometimes sometimes the rich get richer and uh, <laughs> you know there we have seen the meta diversify a bit I wouldn't say necessarily that Ruby Amethyst is as dominant this time around but it really did get some good cards this set that uh that made it continue to be um, a really, really great option for these competitive events. I, I really couldn't agree with you more, Liam. It really continues to shine bright, especially with all the cards that are out. We saw some different variants of the lists uh, for Ruby Amethyst, some playing Jim Hawkins, and some more traditional lists, kind of like how Lorcana Bros is playing here. But I am at least thankful that we are seeing more variants such as Ruby Sapphire. We still are seeing some Amber Steel Song decks and I hope today that we can continue to see more as we get further into the Hunter Burden Memorial Lorcana Championship. And that was round three for all of you viewers at home. We've just finished with Lorcana Bros taking the win. Hopefully we can get in a player interview here in just a second. And we're so thankful to have y'all here at the Hunter Burden Memorial Lorcana Championship. We'll take a quick break as we head on over to our players, see if they'll want to interview, and then we'll be right back. Thank you again, Liam from the Illumiteers for joining us today and for casting with us. Oh, thanks for having me. This is, a, this is a treat. Hey everybody, we are here with the Lorcana Bros team and Aaron Rubin, who you just saw win with that um, Ruby Amethyst deck which I have to give him a hard time about because he resulted back to it. So yeah. Aaron, you got to, so you, uh, um, a couple tournaments here, you switched over to Emerald Steel. You just went back to uh, Ruby Amethyst for, for this tournament. Can you tell us why? Yeah. Um, I still love Green Steel like that. I love that deck play style, but the meta has kind of shifted into a more uh, grindy meta game where there's a lot of blue steel that can kind of go over the top of the Green Steel deck red and blue which can go over the top of the green steel deck so i just needed something that could compete with those two decks um and i'm seeing a lot of that here so i mean it was definitely the right move um so just went back to my old reliable red purple <laughs> which is uh is nice because i had that deck completely foiled out from the last set so i got to play my enchanting <laughs> enchanted mallies right again 
which is I will have to say playing against that is always like such an intimidating thing watching watching Aaron's foil enchanted deck come out against you. Um so how has Inklands impacted your your deck this time around? Yeah, so I think the the two major upgrades it's got is fish hook which is both an amazing offensive and defensive tool to both give your characters evasive to protect them from um, being banished after they lure, and also just as an offensive tool to um, allow your smaller um, static characters to trade up into other bigger characters or to take out locations. Um, so that's the big one. And then obviously the locations itself, which are just passive lore gain if they're they're really difficult to interact with in your deck and protect them really well with your be prepared and your dragon fires. So, so um, one thing since we have like the Lurkana Bros team here, um, something I wanted to talk about just a little bit to, for folks who are new to trading card games, this like team format thing might be a little bit of a unique, um, unique thing. So, can y'all talk about a little bit? what is a team in a trading card games? Like, what does it mean to be a team to y'all? And and how do you guys practice and bounce ideas off of each other? I'm going to I'm gonna you, turn it over to one of your teammates. Take that, yeah. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Adrian, and I am a Lurkana bro. Um, so basically, uh, what team means to me is really, um, we just, we're all hanging out and play testing together. And that's that's really what it is to me, is like hanging out with your friends and then, Aaron actually coined the name Lorcana Bro, and I said that'd actually be a great name for a team. Great. Let me steal that. And so I, I, I forced him at the IkiCon to call us the Lorcana Bros. And then once you speak an idea, it's sort of born. And so from then on, we got the T-shirts and we we did all that as sort of like a, a fun thing to do for ourselves. Um, so that's what being on like a team in a trading card game means to me. But you also mentioned specifically the team format. Are you specifically talking about team trios? Or did you just want to know about what does it mean to be on a trading card game team? I think it means to be on a trading card game team. Okay. Well, that's what it means to me. Cruz? Or I should have by his nickname, Tomatoa. Yeah. So Cruz here, or AKA Tomatoa Bro. Um, yeah. So just being on a team is just exactly what Adrian said. Just jamming out games with, you know, with the bros. Um, you're going to hear the bros a lot. So <laughs> just bear, bear with us. Um, you know, testing ideas, play testing. Uh, I think uh, I didn't play set two, but like for example, set two with Adrian, like we were play testing like probably like two hundred games before the set came out. So always like, with Aaron, or, <laughs> yeah, the Aaron, Aaron. yeah. <laughs> um, one of the bros. So just just doing that and and just seeing like what's fun and then coming to events like this, you know. So just hanging out for the most part. Yeah, we all came here came here together. We all test together. We actually rebelled against Aaron Cruz and I are on Blue Steel, so we're actually not not piggybacking off of Daddy this time. But <laughs> next time maybe. <laughs> No, I love that. So, so basically, like, if you have a group of friends at your LGS, you're practicing together, you're bouncing off of ideas off of each other. You can like call yourself. Sure. You can call yourself. Yeah, absolutely. There are no yeah. rules. <laughs> and yeah, can I just say yeah. some? Uh, as far as teams go, I recently did get um, invited to join a team called Labyrinth TCG. Yeah. Uh, you can find us on Discord. I think it's our Discord channel is called Labyrinth TCG. Um, you know, some of the other members on the team are Wonderland, uh, RMB, Bjorn Fott, Zenuos. There's a lot of really talented players there, and we're all bouncing ideas off of each other there. Um, and so go ahead and join the Discord and check it out. Um, it's a lot of good stuff there. Awesome. So, okay, so you gentlemen are playing Steel Sapphire. Yes. So um, I'm sh hopefully we'll see you guys on the lead table at some point today, but can you tell me a little bit about your decks and why you decided to play Steel Sapphire today? Uh, it's been my favorite deck since set one, and I feel like I got a, a lot of really good tools uh, in the new format. Um, having McDuck Manor um, along came Zeus and Smee, I think has really helped you compete against uh, Red Purple. Um, you still have to watch out for the Medusas, but you no longer have to play around the Tremaines. And then because of the way the meta sort of shifted, Gaston has gotten a lot better. So it's just a deck I really like to play, the Hyper Ramp, and then the Wheel of Fortune is just a... Uh, it's a lot of fun when it goes well. When it doesn't go well, and you're stuck there with like four Inkables in your hand, it feels a lot less good. But uh, the net draws are really hot. So that is your holding world. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, Wheel of Fortune is a magic term for a draw seven. And then uh, anything you want to add? Uh, for me, it was just because of the deck name. Uh, my deck, I call it Suliander, Blue Steel Suliander. Um, and I just wanted to play something fun. Uh, I typically play control, so 
Ruby Purple uh, or Ruby Amethyst Control is typically my go-to. I have it called Cruise Control. Um, mm -hmm. But this time, I just wanted to play something a little bit more easy. Didn't have to think too much about it. Well, just wanna, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I just went on like ink and then wheel, Whoa. ink and wheel. So that's that's my reason for it okay. for the most part. Thank you guys so much. Aaron, do you have any final words as our most recent winner on the lead table? No, I mean, it was a, I, it was actually a matchup that I was like really worried about because I was talking to him before the game and he's playing three spell books and spell book is just like the mirror breaker card. So, and I'm only playing one. So I was really worried just about playing him, but I managed to just kind of uh, tempo him out both games. So, uh, I mean, yeah, really excited for the win. So before I let y'all go, what does it mean to you all to play in the very first Hunter Burton Lorcana um, tournament? And did any of you know Hunter um, before, before he passed? Or, or what does this kind of, what does this specific tournament mean to y'all? Uh, I unfortunately did not know Hunter, but I know that all three of us are really honored to be here. Uh, Robin West gave a really great speech that I think really encapsulates the spirit of the tournament. And so we're just really thankful to be here, really grateful to everyone for putting this on. Um, and I think it's uh, for a great cause. Well, thank you guys so much and good luck to all of you the rest of today. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>